now going to turn over the stage to Brendan Ryan, the Executive Director of Hub Week, and thank you. Hey everybody, thanks for sticking with us. We have two panels left in the Future Forum right now. If you're looking for Colin Angle from iRobot, He's going to be next door in the Blue Dome. And right up here, I'm about to introduce our panel on engineering a better future with George Church, Ben Mesrick, and Jason Kelly. So I am lucky enough to be up here and introduce these guys. We have had a weekend full of illustrious people and uh, incredible ideas shared on this stage. I think this panel might be filled with the most impressive resumes of anyone we've had so far. We start with Ben Mesrick, a Boston resident and New York Times best-selling author. I bet most people in this room have either read one of Ben's books or seen a movie based on one of Ben's books. He first book, Bringing Down the House, which told the story of MIT students and their card counting system that they used to win millions of dollars from casinos from Las Vegas to the Caribbean and everywhere in between, turned into the popular movie 21. His subsequent book, entitled The Accidental Billionaire, told the story of a Harvard dropout who started a company now known as Facebook. Uh, most of you probably saw that movie as The Social Network. Ben's latest book is called Wooly, the true story of the quest to revive one of history's most iconic extinct creatures. I think that's the book with the longest title that he's written so far. Uh, it's probably the reason why most of you are here today. I won't spoil it too much because I know that's what most of the conversation is going to get into. Joining Ben up here on stage will be Dr. George Church, someone you might recognize from appearances on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, uh, as well as his groundbreaking research, which led to CRISPR, the uh, revolutionary gene editing technology that is in the news more and more every day. Joining Dr. Church and Bez on stage will be Jason Kelly, one of the leading biotech entrepreneurs in the Boston area. His company, Ginkgo Bioworks, doesn't have a movie, but it does have a container right outside here in the hub if you want to go check that out afterwards to see how their work is coming to life. His company is located in the seaport. It seems to grow as fast as the seaport grows. Every time we're there, it's bigger with more offices, and they are one of the great success stories of Boston. And last but not least, moderating this illustrious panel is my friend, my boss, uh, and the person who has really helped make everything you see out there and everything you've heard up here take place uh, over the past three years, Linda Henry, Chair of Hub Week and Managing Director of the Boston Globe. Our panel will start. This is going to be fun. Uh, ben, we are the only non-PhDs on stage. I know, the non-scientists <laughs> over here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with you, Ben, since you're the non-scientist. Non right. um, you have written bestsellers like Brendan just talked about, and you've covered a lot of really interesting subjects from blackjack to oil to um, all sorts of other things, but you've never gone this deep in science. Right. How did you come to this story? Well, I can say my parents are much happier when I'm writing about science than Vegas, but um, <laughs> usually I'm writing stories because people pitch me stories. Ever since the social network, every college kid who does something stupid calls me, um, usually from prison, but um, I... Uh, was at home and George uh, was not uh, no no a couple of years ago uh, I started hearing about I read an article about the woolly mammoth revival project and it, it just blew my mind because I live in Boston um, and the idea that a few miles away there might one day be a baby woolly mammoth kind of it just was incredible going for a walk on Boylston <laughs> basically right so I I emailed George out of the blue I just sent a random email um, I found him online. He was actually easy to find online. <laughs> I don't know if I should say that or not. But, um, and I said, I want to come talk to you. And when I first walked in, uh, I was intimidated because, as Linda said, I'm not a scientist. Um, I grew up around scientists and I've always been fascinated by science, but um, incredibly generous with his time. And he said, hang around. And, and, and that's how it all began. So, George, tell us how the process will go of actually bringing back the woolly. How the process of, so, we, well, we don't know until we've done it uh, exactly how it will go, but uh, the most amazing part that's already been done is 
reading DNA that's long dead. I mean, we can read DNA up to 700,000 years old. Second part is then interpreting, putting that in the computer and interpreting it and saying, well, here's the gene for a blood protein, here's the gene for sensors of the, of the cold. And then several genes have been fully revived. Uh, in fact, whole viruses have been revived, and in particular, two genes have been revived and tested for the woolly mammoth, one involving glut, blood and sensing um, at close to freezing point. And they, they live up to, their expecta to our expectations. They, have, uh, they are a cold adapted. So two genes down, several more to go. Um, and tell us about the role of the Asian elephant in this process. So the Asian elephant is um, very closely related to the woolly mammoth, genetically. You can look at their DNA, they're almost like Ben and me. I won't say which is the woollier. <laughs> and, uh, and they are closer to each other than either is to the African elephant. And the African element is, cl is close enough to the Asian that they have actually bred and made uh, a child. Um, and that means that, but on the other hand, they're wildly different in terms of how they look, how they behave. I mean, the mammoth is comfortable, let us say, at minus 40 degrees, while well, the Asian elephant will play in the snow and make giant snowballs, but tw twice as tall as I am, but they're, they can't survive um, at that temperature. And they don't, they have, the mammoth has smaller ears and woollier hair and, and these other adaptations. There is a climate benefit, which is somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, ben, can you talk us through sure. how this is actually beneficial climate-wise to have different yeah, these Yeah, I mean, one back? of the really cool parts of this story is it's not just Jurassic Park. It's not just scientists making prehistoric creatures to fill a zoo. Uh, the goal of the Woolly Mammoth Project is to solve one huge climate issue. Um, so. Uh, the ring of the world, sort of the, the whole kind of top area of the world, is covered in permafrost. The Siberian tundra is this mass of permafrost. And that permafrost is a ticking time bomb. It contains within it more carbon uh, and methane, carbon dioxide and methane, than if we burned all the forests on Earth three times. And that mel ice is slowly melting. When it reaches a certain point and it lets all this out, it's going to be really, really bad for everyone. Um, these Russian scientists, the Zimovs, have been running an experiment since the 80s where they roped off a section of the permafrost and they repopulated it with Pleistocene-type animals. They used bison, reindeer, elk, uh, these hairy horses, and they actually got a World War II-era tank, which they drive up and down the tundra to, to make it seem like a mammoth. And they've managed to lower the temperature of the ice by as much as 15 to 20 degrees uh, Celsius, um, which is an incredible thing. Um, and so the idea is if you could bring back the woolly mammoth, put it back where it belonged, because that's where it used to be, um, it would actually lower the temperature of the permafrost and save us for another century or, or more. That's an incredible idea, and it's a big, crazy idea, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a part of the story that I think is, is incredibly relevant because the idea is we need to live with our environment. We usually are extincting species. We kill off species daily, and here's a way to bring back a species that actually makes the environment better. Now, Jason, you specialize in de-extinction as well, but in a different way. Can you tell us about, more about what you do? Yeah, so uh, Gecko Bioworks basically is in the business of designing and printing DNA. So George talked about reading that DNA, that ancient DNA. What we do down the street is we type letter, you know, A, T, Cs, and Gs into a computer, hit print, and that DNA gets printed out of machines in our office. Uh, and, and what we can do with that is take that ancient DNA sequences. In our case, we're, we're using plants, so like flowering plants from the last ice age where you can go collect a sample uh, that's frozen, not alive anymore, extinct, but you can sample it, read its DNA, find the code that encodes the fragrance, and then print it, move it into brewer's yeast, the kind of yeast that you would use to brew beer, and then when you brew it up, instead of beer coming out, this, the fragrance components of that flower can be produced. 
So it's a way to not resurrect the plant, so not quite the level of ambition of George, uh, but we could maybe resurrect the scent uh, of these lost flowers. Uh, and so, yeah, we're doing it right down the street. Uh, so yeah, that's the project. You use yeast as sort of your, your blank slate for a lot of different things besides the bring back the, ex, the scent of extinct flowers. Can you tell us some of the other things? Yeah, you told, you've told me about rose oil, for example. Yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, the way to look at it is uh, we, we get a lot of kind of ingredients from plants for fragrances, flavors, things like that. Those are all genetically encoded. And so the idea is could we design a new rose oil uh, by, by redesigning the genes in the rose, uh, but do it faster by this brewing method. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what we do is we design microbes to do all kinds of things. Uh, and so we, we recently announced a partnership in the agriculture area, for example, uh, where we're designing microbes that could live on crops to have them produce fertilizer. So the idea is you wouldn't have to add fertilizer to the field. So there's really, you should think of a microbe kind of like a, a little machine that can do all kinds of stuff and it runs on DNA code. And so if you can redesign it, you can make it do new things. So you recently purchased a company that George started. Can you tell us about the connection that you have between your work? Sure. Look, we'll go back and forth. The Gen 9 was the company. Uh, it was uh, aimed at manufacturing DNA, and Ginkgo was one of our best customers by far. Um, and so, it, and we had a lot of terrible customers who wanted the DNA immediately. It had to be perfect. They would give us really terribly difficult sequences. Um, and Ginkgo was a terrific customer because they knew the reality. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll turn it over. Yeah, so, so George's company, which was, came out of work in his lab, Gen 9, this is that DNA printing technology, which, you know, my background, PhD, bioengineering, th this is magic, right? I mean, if you, you know, th like people don't appreciate, but inside every organism is a genome, which is digital code, right? It, 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 it's, you know, we didn't design that. It came from three billion years of evolution. But if you go in, it, there's code almost like computer code. And our ability to read it has gotten, what, George, the first human genome was $100 million, and now Illumina's got new machines to do? Well, it, it was $3 billion, yeah. <laughs> now, now it's 1,000. 1,000, yeah. right. Yeah. Veritas so, Genetics has a little booth out there. Yeah. Right, so you're looking at, you know, million-fold cost reduction over the last 17 years. That, that puts the improvement in computers to complete shame. So this our ability, is like the opposite of Moore's Law. It's faster than Moore's Law, yeah. It, it much is, faster. It is much faster. And, and nobody appreciates this, right? But what that's letting us do is go out and read that code that's in every organism. And what George invented in his lab was the opposite. Well, he also invented the reading, but he also <laughs> invented the opposite 20 years later, which is the writing. And so you, you, now you go in the computer, you hit your ATCG, you hit print, and the machines at Gen 9 could print that out. And we were just buying, you know, we're about 40% of worldwide gene printing is designed at Ginkgo. We were buying so much, it made more sense to buy the company. That worked out well. <laughs> ben, there's a great story in yeah. how this whole synthetic biology um, industry came up because it's, it's new and it right. really has its roots here in Boston. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's spectacular. I remember going into George's lab in the beginning and the thing that blew my mind immediately was how much farther along we are than I thought. Like what you're saying is I didn't know that we're on the verge of all of this incredible change. I mean, in one corner of the lab, they're working on mosquitoes to beat malaria. Uh, there's, you know, a project to make mice to beat Lyme disease. Um, there's reverse aging technology that comes out of this, the idea that our kids could live 150 years or maybe their kids will live 150 years. These are spectacular changes going on and it's all happening in Boston right around the corner. I had no idea that we were that far along. And then the idea of a woolly mammoth I felt that's the story to tell that encapsulizes all of this because it's easy to sell a woolly mammoth. People love the woolly mammoth. They Kids love, the mammoth. love the woolly mammoth. Love the mammoth. How do you get a 15-year-old <laughs> interested in DNA? Um, you tell them there's going to be a woolly mammoth. And uh, oh, I got interested. <laughs> right, right. I will say, nearly everybody I interviewed in George's lab, the reason they were interested was because of the movie Jurassic yeah, Park. Without question. Um, Jurassic Park led to a whole generation of genetic scientists. And yeah. so, you know, 
that shows the power of, of uh, giant dinosaurs, I guess, or whatever, but it's, it's a cool you know, moment. Anyways, for me, it was just spectacular how much is going on here in Boston and how close we are to this n brand new world. It's a revolution. Our kids will grow up in a very different world because of what you guys are doing. Um, and most of us don't have any idea what you're doing. So it's, it's cool to make it, you know, <laughs> open and out there. Which is why meetings like this are so important, to be clear, right? Like, you know, we, we, I spend a fair bit of effort trying to, to talk about this technology and get it out there. We, we think it's really important that people understand, particularly as the cost for doing this is falling, it's gonna start entering more consumer goods, right? Like up till now, biotechnology's largely been in the pharmaceutical industry and a little bit in food, but you know, it hasn't been in, in you know, your phone, in your clothes, and, and, and it's coming, you know? And so people need to learn about it, understand it, and build trust with it for that to be possible. So when you brought up Jurassic Park, it's also, it's the power of, it's the importance of telling the story, right? So what you did was you told the story of the woolly mammoth and through George's work, um, which is also going to be made into a movie. Yes. Um, and George, you were you made some really interesting comments about the um, the production cost of the movie versus <laughs> your production costs. Yeah, I'm not sure the movie likes me saying this, but uh, that's okay. They're, they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as with almost all big movies, where uh, it, it's about a thousand times more costly to make a movie than it is to do the research up to this point. <laughs> uh, so it kind of puts things in perspective, you know, you know, where we fit into this universe. Uh, what will arrive first, the movie out in, in, uh, in DVD or The Woolly Mammoth? I, I love that question. The Woolly Mammoth or The Mermaid, which one first? Which one will, will, will come first? Yeah, I'm afraid the movie will probably be, the book has already beat, beat the reality and the movie <laughs> will as probably as well. Yeah, I, I get asked a lot, yeah, well, I know George probably gets asked more than I do, but when is there going to be a woolly mammoth? I get asked that every day by my seven-year-old, actually. He's, he wants one. He wants the first one, George. Um, in the book, there are three answers to that question. I am an incredible optimist, maybe because I'm not actually a scientist. Um, and so my answer in the book was three years. Um, Stuart Brand, who wrote one of the epilogues of the book, the wonderful conservationist and sort of icon of the 60s, he said 100 years. And then George said, sooner than you think. And I have spoken to George about this at length. And he has said that five years is not an impossible number. Um, uh, but um, it, it's happening so fast. Everything is changing so quickly. The, the, the strategy to get there is there. We know how to do it. Um, it's just a matter of doing it. And, and like he's saying, it's a matter of money as well. The movie will probably cost $100 million. A woolly Mammoth would probably cost a lot less than $100 million, maybe. Um, but um, hopefully there will be a woolly Mammoth at the premiere. That, that would be incredible. <laughs> but, George, you had such an interesting way that you got this project funded, which Ben talked about in the book. Can you talk to us about that lunch that you went to? Well, there are quite a few projects in my lab which uh, are not suitable for, for government funding, and I felt that this was one from the beginning. We do... <laughs> it's not... <laughs> not your yeah. tax dollars at work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so don't worry about your taxes. Uh, um, and there is a certain amount of money we have around just so that people can act on, on their crazy ideas for a little while and just... If you're going to fail, fail fast, get it out of your system, don't bother to write a grant. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I ha was having uh, breakfast with Peter Thiel one day, and, and he said, tell me your craziest ideas, you know, they don't have to be profitable. We were talking about business up to that point. And I said, well, you know, let's see, aging reversal, um, which I know he, he's very interested in that topic. Um, artificial technology via neurons, and, and I thought the least likely was mammoth. And he says, mammoth. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so he, fun he funded us. Uh. Jason, that's how your investor meetings go too, right? Yeah, just, just like that, exactly the same. Mammoth, and the checks come. Tell us, about, you have raised an incredible amount of money, and you're doing really, you have taken on some really large projects. You touched on some of them. Can you touch on some more? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, we raised about $200 million at Ginkgo over the last couple of years. It's, it's funny because the beginnings of Ginkgo were totally different, actually. We, we started it out of grad school at MIT. We had no funding. Actually, one MIT professor wrote us, a, that's a founder of the company, wrote us a small check, but not enough to found a lab. So Tell when, them about the dumpster dive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when, when labs would uh, shut down at MIT, they sent an email out to the biology lab list, like, other labs, do you want our glassware? And so those people would come and take lab supplies they needed, and who wants this equipment? That would happen. And then at the very end, they'd be like, we're literally throwing this away. If anyone else wants it, just take it. You know, <laughs> save us the moving costs. And that's when we would show up and collect all this junk and put it in a big pile in a storage facility, and that became our first lab. Uh, so the beginning, you know, first four or five years of Ginkgo was much more of a bootstrap, building slowly. But as the infrastructure built up, um, as I mentioned, about 200 million in capital to really scale out our facility down here in the seaport. Uh, and one of the new projects we just announced, uh, I mentioned, uh, about a, uh, it's a $100 million joint venture with, with Bayer Crop Sciences, which is a big agriculture company. And the project is to try to work on the problem of nitrogen fertilizer. So we get our fertilizer today essentially from the air. So about 72% of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas, but plants can't, they can't use that even though they need nitrogen to live. Uh, and, and so what we do is we suck that air into big chemical plants, we add a ton of energy, 3% of worldwide natural gas, to make $80 billion a year worth of nitrogen fertilizer. We bag it, we ship it, and then farmers drag it out on the fields and fertilize the fields. Except for peanut plants. Peanut plants you don't need to fertilize. And that's because there's microbes that live in their roots that do that same chemical reaction as the big chemical plant. They take nitrogen gas and they turn it into solid form of nitrogen ammonia right there and self-fertilize the plant for free. Trouble is, we eat more than peanuts. Uh, so our you know, big food crops, corn, rice, and wheat, half of global nitrogen, they don't make this stuff themselves. And so what we're doing is taking the microbes that live on that corn, taking the genetic design from the peanut microbes, redesigning it and moving it into those, those corn microbes. So hopefully we can wean them off that nitrogen fertilizer and they can fertilize themselves over time. We can get that 3% of global uh, greenhouse gas back and save a lot of money for farmers. Uh, so yeah, so it's a, it's a cool project and, and just in the last month we announced it, so. So both of you are using synthetic biology to, com to combat climate change. Is this one of the biggest problems that you think that synthetic biology can really have a role? Well, it's uh, most suggestions that you'll see about climate change are kind of slowing down the inevitable. They're, you know, solar panels, uh, more efficient cars, and uh, uh, mammoths, and so forth. Slowing, it. but there is uh, the possibility of using uh, re reversing it, of actually sequestering carbon. And one of the best ways to sequester carbon happens every day is the algae in the ocean. Um, about 15% of the carbon in the air, which is more than the global warming problem, is fixed every year by the, the photosynthesis in the ocean. If we, but it, it immediately gets, they get killed by viruses and it goes back up into the air, just like a very quick cycle. Um, if we could tra transfer, trap that carbon, we could, we could solve it. So that's, that's an example where you can be inspired by biology and possibly harness it to solve this problem. I mean, we don't know what the solution is, but we need to think out of the box if we're going to reverse it. Um, you brought something with you. Can you, yeah. can you show us what that is? Yeah, sure. So uh, this is a, um, a product from a, a, a company called Bolt Threads. They're out in California. Uh, and they're using biotechnology to work on uh, textiles. So I mentioned you know, the cost for doing this is coming down, so it's starting to move into consumer products. And so what, what this is is a tie uh, made out of spider silk, all right? And today all of your silk comes from silkworms, all right? Uh, and, but spider silk has really interesting properties, like it's stronger relative to its weight compared to silkworms. But we can't commercially get spider silk. And the reason is if you put 10 spiders in a box, they just fight until there's one spider left, right? You can't farm spiders. Also, a spider farm is horrifying, right? Like we, don't, we don't have spider farms, we don't want to go there. Uh, and, and so uh, what, what they've done at Bold is they've did the same thing. They sequence the spider, they read the DNA, they find the genes that encode the silk, they move it into that brewer's yeast, and they brew up spider silk. They spin it out, and then you get, you know, the world's first biotech textile, right? And, and so it's a really, it's an interesting moment 
Because you know, if you look back in 1982, we had the first biotech therapeutic in human insulin, right? Now today, 50% of your therapeutic drugs are made with biotech. So you know, if you're a textile company now, if you're, you're Nike, you have to start asking, you know, are 50% of the textile supply chain in 20 years gonna be made with biotechnology? You know, I'd argue, yeah, right? There's a lot of interesting materials out there in nature that we could now start to make commercially, and it's gonna be an enormous opportunity, and you'll see it starting to show up in products you buy at the store. So it's a, it's a really fun time right now. So I got to hear the, um, the creators of Bolt Thread talk, and I thought that there are reasons for why we need an innovation. So they, they showed a map of the innovations in textiles, and the last big innovation was polyester. nylon or something, nylon yeah, in like polyester. 1965. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we've, we're discovering that there is plastic showing up in everything now, yeah. uh, you know, and this solves that. Yeah, so this is biodegradable, right? So, so the, what's, what's happening now is a lot of fibers that are made like in a, like a synthetic fleece. It get, ends up in little teeny fragments out in the ocean, fish eat it, and Every then it works its way through the food chain and you're getting little bits of plastic. Uh, and there's really not a good solution for this. There's no way to recover that. The, the solution is to stop using synthetic fibers, right? And, and so what we're gonna need are different performance natural fibers that when you're done with it and you throw it away, it, it degrades in a way that plays well with the planet. And this is, I mean, I think this is an, actually an important trend overall. Like, how we make things today is we basically dig holes in the ground, we take out materials, we take out oil, we, we process it through big plants, we make a product, and when we're done with that product, we throw it in a landfill, and it sits there, basically, and doesn't break down. That's, that's not gonna last. Whether climate change gets us or not, the hole's gonna run out at some point, and we're not gonna be able to make stuff. Uh, and so, on the other hand, biology as a manufacturing technology has played well with the planet for three billion years, right? It makes things every year, then it, they degrade and it rebuilds new things at unbelievably low cost, right? Like, it's the manufacturing technology we should be using to make everything, basically. Uh, but we gotta learn how to program it to do that. So, we're seeing a, a, a new future potential in textiles. And George, in your lab, you're working on mosquitoes, for example, and some other, can you tell us a little bit more about the potential there? Right. Uh, ben just barely touched on the subject, but, but we're, we're trying to engineer mosquitoes um, so that they can uh, be resistant to malaria and, and mice so they can be resistant to Lyme disease. We're not necessarily harming the mosquitoes of the mice, although some people wouldn't mind it if we harmed the mosquitoes. Um, and, and, that's, and this is because the vaccines and the drugs keep failing for Lyme disease and, and malaria and we don't really have a solution despite many decades of effort. Uh, so the opportunity there is to spread through the population in a very natural, well, um, synthetic biology, unnatural way, uh, exponentially through the population this. We need to be very cautious about it though, so we have to test it in large dome villages, kind of like, like this, except with natural you know, goats and, and, and plants uh, growing underneath it. And, uh, and, we need, and in the case of the mice, we're testing it in uh, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, um, where the people of those islands really dislike um, Lyme disease and are willing to participate in, in having their whole island rid of, of the disease. Release the mosquitoes right now? <laughs> we are in a dome. Yeah, right? I'm a little worried about the dome situation. Release the mosquitoes. <laughs> Uh, George, you have um, been based here. Why is your lab in Boston, and why do you feel like this is a place, the best place for your lab to be? Oh yeah, that's that's it's not even close. Uh, I mean, it's really fantastic. Uh, you know, you could argue that Boston and sort of the San Francisco Bay Area are the two hubs for high technology, electronics, internet, and so forth. But over the years, Boston has started to accumulate more and more pharma and biotech and investors that are interested in pharma and biotech because they have slightly longer, it's not that much longer, but slightly longer time horizons. And um, that combination of the Harvard, MIT and other universities, it's really a university hub as well. And so it's not, it, there really is no other place that you can get uh, the amazing graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, 
investors in startup companies that you can get, specifically in biology. Now, if, if this were internet, you know, I, I would be torn between two coasts, but in biology, there's, no, there's nothing close. And how about you, Jason? You, you left MIT and you went to South Boston. Yeah, well, we, we, we opened the lab in Seaport mainly because Kendall Square was way too expensive considering we had no money. Uh, and then it turned out to be great because in the eight years since then, now it's like the most popular place in the city. Uh, but, you know, I'd echo what George said, um, maybe with one caveat. The, you know, the talent pool for life science here is just, you, you, it's not competitive anywhere else. Um, so that, that's a big reason for us to get the, these, you know, specialist people that are trained to do this type of work is huge. Uh, and also just like a community of people that are passionate about life sciences, that matters a lot, and the, and the proximity to the, the universities. Um, funding's a little different. I actually, I always recommend people just go to California to raise money. They just throw around money more there. So uh, I'd, I'd recommend you head to the West Coast, get your money, come back and do your work here. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> um, this, this, this next question I have for all of you, but I'm gonna start with you, George, because I've heard you talk about the importance of creativity in science. and. You know, the purpose of, of Hub Week is, is showing how art, science, and technology, all three of those are required to build this really next wave of the future. Can you talk to me about, your, for you, how the, the art of science, the creativity of science, and, and how you nurture it? Right, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's not necessarily all science labs need that. Uh, there is quite a bit you can contribute through, um, turning the crank, for example. Um, but, some, but we do need it for developing new technologies, and most people would agree that, that the revolutions that occur are limited by the technology. It is a bottleneck of sorts. Um, you know, we, we try our best to keep ours at the cutting edge and keep it highly creative. We have artists in residence at my lab and in the Wies Institute, um, which my lab is part of. And this really helps. They, they imagine things that are slightly impractical, but highly desirable. And then we say, well, what, why not? I mean, what, what, what stops us from making these things real? You know, for example, Joe Davis is an artist in, in our lab, and he thought of encoding um, art into DNA back in the 80s and actually did it. Um, it was just 26 base pairs of DNA, but it still it was a start. And then I, a few years later, I encoded my own art into DNA, which was a book including all the photographs and images in it. Um, and then now, um, we've made a, we've encoded movies into DNA with Technicolor, and Microsoft has done it uh, with OK Go. I don't know if you've uh, any OK Go fans here, but they make great MTV. Um, and, it, and it's suddenly it's a whole field where where people that are worried about archival information are starting to look to this as being uh, a lot less expensive, less energy intensive, longer lives, and so forth. You have an artist in residence. Yeah, not so. She's, she's, raise your hand. She's right there in the second row. The, uh, I recommend you check out. We have, we have uh, one of the containers out here is uh, not size so work. They, so we, we ran the experiment of, of having a designer in residence over the last year at Ginkgo, and uh, not so has been working on dyeing textiles with live microbes. So actually putting, a, putting silk down, that's just white silk, putting uh, media that these microbes can grow on, painting these certain species of microbe that make these dyes, and then they grow into the silk and leave this dye in there in a really natural way. Uh, and they are spectacular. Like, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it's an interesting twist because you have less control over the process than with a traditional dyeing process, right? When you traditionally dye, you get everything exactly what you want. You're, you're kind of giving in a little bit to, a little bit of the control to the microbes and letting them be artists too, uh, which I think is a kind of an amazing direction for, for biology to go and, and helps us think about how we might interact with the textile industry at Ginkgo as we go into that business. Ben, yes. you are an artist. Hi. Well, I don't, I, people don't usually use that word around me, but I, I, in some yeah. ways, I guess that's true. You use, you rely on your creativity. Yes, I'm, I'm yes. I, uh, I'm much more an artist than a scientist, I'll say that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm fascinated by the sort of intersection of where art uh, meets science and, and the idea that, um, for me, it's, Communicating science is, is, is my goal with Just a project important. like this and getting people to, who wouldn't necessarily 
understand it um, to hopefully understand a little bit more about it. But uh, I don't know. It's fascinating. I mean, there's so much. There's so so many areas you can go into in that world. Yeah. I'm going to ask one more question before I turn it over to you guys to ask questions. Um, I want to know uh, one what you were most afraid of, and then to what you were most hopeful for, especially in regards to what biotechnology can help us with. Ben, what are you most afraid uh, of? So just from, you know, getting my foot into this world just a little bit, I am afraid of the idea of, of, of somebody getting a hold of something like a virus and, and then playing with it in a bad way. Um, the idea of science being done in secret all over the world, not just in labs, but in basements, because it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. You know, the same technology that allows you to make a mosquito that can't carry malaria might allow you to make a mosquito that can carry something worse. So that, that I'm afraid of when it's done in secret, yeah. You're also afraid of spiders. And spiders, yeah, too, spiders. yeah. I guess silk spider. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I, I'd say, you know, I think we had, um, there's sort of two experiences with biotechnology over the last 25 years. One is in the pharmaceutical industry and one is in the food industry around GMO crops, which has been not a great experience for those of us who like genetic engineering. Uh, and, you know, I, I think um, what I'm most afraid of is that the, the companies deploying this generation of the technology don't appreciate that the issue is trust, right? Like people need to trust that the folks deploying this technology are doing it in their interest, right? And, and I think that, and, and the foundation of trust is transparency. So, you know, you come to our facility, there's 60 foot glass walls that look into the lab. We like to talk about what we're doing. We're very transparent. We want you to know it's in the products that get made. Um, you know, it should be labeled. We should be proud of it. Uh, I think getting that right for this generation of biotechnology, I'm afraid that the impulse of companies is often, ooh, I'm like, you know, I want to, tell anybody anything, I think it's a, it's a huge mistake. We need to be really transparent this time around. I, I guess I'm most concerned about nat, our natural disasters and that we don't respond to them rather than unnatural, although I am also concerned that we will mess up as scientists and engineers. Um, and then on the hopeful side, I think we have this exponential that as long as we are thoughtful about it, transparent, communicate, listen very well, not just talk, um, then we might be able to handle some of these natural disasters, uh, part, you know, some of which are natural only because we're 7.5 billion people uh, in the world. But, you know, th things having to do with, with starvation, with um, malaria, with vitamin A deficiency, global warming and so forth. I'll add a hopeful. Uh, I'm hopeful that the movie, uh, the Wooly movie, ends up being like this generation's Jurassic Park. Because yeah. let me tell you, that, that Jurassic Park had a big impact on me. And it, it is this whole generation of, of biological engineers were built on that movie. So that's my hope. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the goal. And the goal is in this one, the scientist is the good guy. You know, usually in Hollywood, the scientist is the bad guy. The goal of Wooly is that, you know, it's not Wooly Mammoths rampaging through Boston. <laughs> Although I wouldn't be surprised if one will he maybe rampages a little bit. But um, in general, it's to make people want to be scientists and see that scientists offer us the solutions to our problems um, more than they cause the problems, you know. Um, I was with, we did a, uh, a program earlier this week uh, with Ben and the mayor and Vertex, and uh, we had it full of Boston Public School students who had all read this book. And the light it turned on for them was so inspiring and just the potential of and the excitement of um, of what you wrote about. So thank you for sharing the story. I've asked a lot of questions, but now it is your turn. Um, I hope you have good ones. I know there's some people from George's lab here too, so I'm hoping they can stump him. Thank you. I feel like I'm, I'm so excited to be back in school. Um, can you just explain, because I cannot wrap my head around this, what it means to encode a book into microbes? <laughs> right. Yes. Books and movies. So, so, we, so almost everything in our modern world is digital, meaning it's made up of zeros and ones. When you see it on the screen, that's because it's gone from a disk drive, zeros and ones, onto a screen, which is basically zeros and ones as well. And so we, our, my book uh, had images that were zeros and ones and text. 
and we turn the zeros into A or C and the ones into G or T. And then the reverse process is every time you see a G or T, you read it as a one and so forth. And so we wrote it into, uh, um, into DNA like the process that Jason described. And then we read it by the same process in which we read the, the mammoth DNA and all the other DNA, the ancient plant DNA that he read. So we went through the whole process of encoding it and then reading it back out. And that's how we do movies as well. The heart of that is that DNA is digital code in the first place, yeah. right? There, there are four, four bases and two numbers, right? Yeah. Besides the trust, which uh, let's say we do have trust, uh, what about the, the unintended consequences of that the may only manifest itself in decades or maybe even longer time that, that we do not know? Uh, I mean, is there a way to actually accelerate some tests on those things? Sure, so the, the question is, you know, trust is important, but what about things that you're doing with good intent and there's an unintended consequence? Is that fair to say? The, the you know, I, Safety is an important part of every new technology we develop, so I think we'll have to approach that the same way we approach safety as we brought computers online and chemistry online and all these other technologies that end up doing a lot of good. We have to also make sure we understand the parts of them that could go wrong and regulate and keep it safe, right? Uh, and that's a process that we, we will do, and we'll do it carefully over time, and every industry goes through it. I think it's, but it, it absolutely is, is uh, something that will play out in biotech as it moves into more things, just like it's done in every other industry. Uh, Jason, this is a question for you. Um, this is actually an hour, uh, about an hour ago, I was having a conversation um, when you mentioned GMOs before. And is that ever an issue for you that when you're kind of considering creating something that you think of wider ranging things when you're actually doing that? Um, because like with GMOs, we did that so something could survive well, but then we have like the pesticides and other things that are harming us and harming the bees and you know whatnot. Yeah, so, so, so sort of a question around, you know, the, the what's the purpose of the engineering in, in a GM that you're doing? And, and, and so, so I think the key thing about, so, so a couple things on GMOs. So I had an editorial in the New York Times last summer that basically said, we're a company that makes GMOs, we think you should label GMOs. So, so number one, I think you want to be transparent, not just about the fact that it's GM, but what are you changing? Why? Why? Why are you doing it? What do you expect the effect? And, and this is why I'm really excited about the, the nitrogen fertilizer project. So Walmart did a study, there's an NPR article three weeks ago about this, where they looked at all the products on their shelves, and in more than half of the best-selling products, the number one contributor to greenhouse gas is nitrogen fertilizer. And so this is one where it can help save farmers money. They're gonna spend less on fertilizer. But the reason Walmart's doing that study is there's enormous consumer pull to try to reduce greenhouse gas, and they know that Walmart's a big point source because they sell a lot of stuff. So, so what does Walmart do with that information? They turn around and put pressure on suppliers and say, hey, can we use less fertilizer somehow? That, that's a good thing, right? So, so but you, it's important to consider yeah, what is the reason you're doing this, right? And uh, we think in this case, it's one that has both good consumer interest and also on the backside saves money for farmers, so it's a double win. Hi, thank you, thank you all for um, this discussion. Um, I guess this is probably a, a question for Dr. Church. Um, I'm curious about the story of the woolly, and, and um, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that that um, Ben, I have not read your book, so I don't know this this full story. Um, but I'm curious because you, you talked about the funding by Peter Thiel. Um, which came first, the the idea of recreating a woolly mammoth, or the application um, to uh, keep the perma, you know, maintain the uh, cool temperature of permafrost? And also, um, could you talk about the, a little bit about the how of the um, permafrost, <clears throat> maintaining the temperature of permafrost, how that is done by the woolly mammoth? A little bit for the, the lay people in the sure. audience. Thank you. So in a way, they, they both came first. Uh, so I was in, my lab was interested in, well, I was interested in woolly mammoths since I was a kid, you know, like a lot of kids are. 
But my lab was interested in re reversal uh, of the carbon um, global warming by sequestration and photosynthesis. So that pre predated it. That goes back to the 1990s. Um, but then the interest in the mammoth came from innocent inquiries as, as some of the technology we developed was being used to read out ancient animals. The question kept coming up by, by journalists, well, could you check that, that, that this ancient DNA had properties that, that we all speculated it had? And then we, we started thinking about putting the two together and, you know, and prioritizing what would be the most in, interesting um, species to bring back um, from extinction. And so it all kind of came together. But I would say to first approximation was the idea of de-extinction first and then the climate change second. Um, and then Ben can actually probably do a better job than I can in explaining. How, it, uh, how, how a woolly how, mammoth keeps the world cooler. Right. Um, so uh, there's a couple of processes that go on. Um, one of them is that the woolly mammoth uh, essentially terraforms the environment um, to make it better. It knocks down trees and uh, changes the type of grass that grows that uh, allows, uh, it keeps um, certain type of plant life, draws in more heat, and what the woolly mammoth does is knocks down the trees that draw in more heat and allows these grasses to grow that are more reflective. Also, it digs up the snow. Snow is a very good insulator, and it keeps the very cold air from touching the permafrost. The mammoths dig it up, the cold air touches the ground, and then the mammoths pack it back down, and it actually keeps it cool um, in that way. Um, so there's actually a couple processes going on, and uh, they've done this experiment uh, you know, over 20 years, um, uh, and it's, it's spectacular data that they have. Um, and they use a tank that they actually stole um, from a, a, an army base in Russia and, and were sort of mimicking a mammoth and then these other animals to do it. But what's really an interesting point is that animals, for the most part, live in concert with the environment. Before people came around, there were millions of mammoths. Um, they were spread out across this permafrost. The ice was melting. It was the end of an ice age, but the mammoth was doing okay. Um, this was about 12,000 years ago, and then we decided to eat them. Um, and we ate them all, um, and, uh, and now there aren't any mammoths, and the environment changed. One of the points made in the, in the book by these Russian scientists is it wasn't that the environment changed and thus the mammoth died. It was the mammoth died and thus the environment changed, um, which is a really cool way to look at it. Hi. Thank you for this fascinating discussion. Um, after you make the first mammoth, what's next? Do you make another one of another gender and let them reproduce? Or do you mass produce, you know, an army of mammoths? What was the last, what was the last part? Is this on? I know. Do you mass produce an army of mammoths, or do you let the population grow naturally? I, I'm not sure army is, maybe a herd would be the, 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 the <laughs> uh, I, I think the, we're, we're trying, we're actually trying to do this the hard way, oddly, um, so that we don't interfere with the reproduction of the, of the endangered species. Um, we're trying to get the, them to reproduce outside the body. Of the, of the female elephant. Um, this, this is very common in most vertebrates, including some mammals like the, the duck-billed platypus that form as eggs. Uh, so we're, we're, we're developing this technology in mice. It may have other applications beyond uh, this project. Uh, so if we do that, then it will scale very nicely. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that ginkgo would do this necessarily, but somebody might be able to scale this up so we can make you know, 100,000 simultaneously. They are a very social animal, so you have to think through how they would get properly socialized. But there's plenty of precedent for rewilding of animals like the California condor and the American bison, which essentially were extinct from the wild. And, and to bring them back, they had to make hand puppets and things like that to feed the condor. So I think it's gonna be an interesting set of animal behavior experts, ecologists, it's going to be artists. It's going to be a very fascinating um, process. 
Thank you so much. I was, I was just given the, the cut sign. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you all so much. Um, I encourage you to learn more about these companies. I encourage you to check out the Wooly book and enjoy the rest of the Hubble. Thank you.